Holy Spirit, remake me. Transform me. Make me more like Jesus. Don't stop until I look like him. Live like him. Think like him. Pray like him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. And all God's children said amen. We're going to spend some time in worship. And at the end of that time, Pastor Andrew is going to share some things with you this week. Gloria. 
of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us be overcome by your presence, by your assurance, Father. God, we need you. We need your presence. We need your direction. Lord, we need your wisdom. God, you are faithful, Lord, to provide all of those things. Lord, if we humble ourselves, we be seek you, Father.
even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop. Declare his promises this morning. Hallelujah. Praise him for what he's done. Praise him for what he's yet to do. Lord, we continue to praise you for the things that we have not seen yet, Father. We thank you for those things that are not seen. Because we know that you are faithful. You never stop working. So this morning, we stand upon your word, your promises, Hallelujah. and we declare it this morning to be so. Thank you this morning for your faithfulness. Thank you for everything that we have cried out to you for. You're working on our behalf. Even when I don't see it, you're working, Father God. Lord, even when I feel all along, you've never left me. You're there all the time. You're working on my behalf. This morning, we thank you. We praise you because you deserve the praise. You alone are God. You alone are faithful. Lord, you are our King, our Savior. We choose to praise you this morning. We choose to praise you this morning. Lord, we make the choice this morning to praise you, our faithful, sovereign God. Jesus. Before we started this song, sometimes you have to be obedient when you don't want to be. The pastor knows me, I'm a creature of habit and color. But this song came to me and I should have stopped, but I didn't. Not practice it, 
Quite honestly, I don't even know the whole song. But I want us to sing, turn your eyes to Jesus. Oh, Lord have mercy. Yes, indeed. We're just going to sing the chorus part. And I want you to close your eyes. There's uncertainty, instability, but he is not. He's not unstable. Whatever you're facing, he knew long before you got to that point. What you choose to make of it is up to you. Tough or not, you'll walk right through it with you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look. turn our eyes to you this morning, Father. We turn our eyes to you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to share something with you real quick. Pastor Kelly had no idea because we didn't communicate about, we don't communicate about worship service, the music part. I trust her. About 35 years ago, in other days of ministry. I went into a funeral home to visit a family I'd never met. And the mother, the funeral director showed me who the family was. The mother was sitting in an area with a lot of family members around. She was about to bury her third child I walked over there and I put my hand out and I just stooped over and I said, ma'am, I'm the minister. And she took my hand and I fell to my knees. I couldn't help it. She had piercing blue eyes. She looked me right in my eyes. I said, how did you do this? How do you make it through this? You know what she told me? She said, sweetheart, when you can't see your way and you know there ain't no way, you turn your eyes to Jesus. She said, in the midnight hour, when I wept myself to sleep, and I wept so much, I had no moisture. I was dehydrated. She said, I tried to stand up out of the bed, and I fell over on the ground. And I crawled to the kitchen. And she said, my refrigerator door opened, but there was nobody in there. She said, I was crawling to the refrigerator. She said, the light came on. She thought, who else is in this house? She looked up. That refrigerator door was wide open. There was a bright light there. And a hand reached out and gave her some water. You know what she told me? She said, young man, because I was young then. She said, young man. She put her arm around me. She said, one day you're going to know 
you're going to know what it means to have visitation. She says, because when Jesus shows up, you can go through anything. I was supposed to preach the funeral service about 45 minutes later. But as my wife knows, I'm a weeping prophet. I cried and cried and cried some more. And I asked her if she would mind saying something to the family and friends that had come to bid goodbye to her third child. I never will forget that day as long as I live. And that song, Pastor Kelly, means more to me. I love all the modern songs. I sing them all. It's all I listen to. That song has a special meaning to me. Reach over and take the hand right beside you, would you? See, the person you're beside right now may not know what you're going through. You might look good on the outside, but something else is going on in the inside. Today, let's turn our eyes toward Jesus. Father, we look away from all things that will distract. And help us first and foremost to look to Jesus. And there's nobody around to help. He's the light that illuminates, that warms, that changes the environment and the atmosphere. Oh, Jesus. And the things of will grow strange. Lift that hand up to heaven with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring every burden, everything, everything that concerns us, Father, we give it to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you're so faithful. Thank you that you know us. When we get up, when we lie down, where we go, what we do. And at the end of a disappointing day or disappointing situation, you're our counselor and our comforter. You pick us up. You speak life over us. And we receive from your hand. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you and we celebrate you today. You are the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. You are the bright in the morning star, Lord Jesus. In the midnight hour, I see because you're with me. In Jesus' name. Come on, give him an ovation of praise this morning that will rattle the roof. Come on, somebody. Give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. He will see you through, my friend. He will see you through. I guarantee it. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. How many of you have never heard that last song before? What? Uh, it's a beautiful song. I haven't heard it in a long, long time. It's very appropriate for today. How many of you are excited about being in God's house this morning? Hey, we have a couple really quick announcements before we move on. Some folks have to chase us down after service because we forget we're not taking up offering in here. Many of you use our online application, and that's very easy for you to do. You can even set up a reoccurring so you don't even have to think about it. Uh, makes me question sacrificial giving just a little bit, but I'm just kidding. Uh, at the conclusion of service, somebody will be standing at the back door, and I'm nominating Seth to do that. Uh, with a bag. So if you brought paper, money, or a check for your offering, please see him, run him down, and uh, make sure that he gets that. We don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to give this morning. We have some exciting things coming up in the next few weeks. First of all, Monday night, 630. If you can be here, the sanctuary is open for prayer. What an awesome time uh, and way to begin your week each week. How many? If your Mondays are anything like my Mondays and Fridays are, you need some prayer at, after work to get, be able to have the motivation to go to work on Tuesday. So be here at 6.30 for prayer. Uh, Wednesday nights, if you're interested in going out with us to provide meals for uh, those uh, that we usually bring into church on Wednesday nights, please see one of us and we will let you know when to be here and what time to be here. 
it's an awesome opportunity to get to reach out to some of our kids uh, that we normally get, get to reach out to right here on the campus, but we can't right now. Uh, during this time, how many of you have gotten a lot of projects done at home during, during COVID? How, how many of you caught up? How many of you are still slackers and your wives are still, <laughs> Michael's confessing. Hey, sometimes in the, in the face of a dark time, opportunity arises. And uh, the, the house of God is no different. So a few years ago, anybody ever remember that show? Uh, and I can't remember what it was called, but it was like they systematically went through what certain cities would look like one day after humans, one week, one you know, and, and so, you know, you, you kind of see nature take back over. You know, the house of God has not had as much activity in it. Uh, most of our activity has been online. So it further compounds uh, the possibility that things could fall into disrepair, not to mention that our facility is 20 plus years old. So we have an opportunity to take this time to do some things that need to be done around God's house. So Tonight at 3, or this afternoon at 3 o'clock, uh, you're invited to come up here and uh, kind of see a walkthrough of, of some of the things that need to be done here at God's house, because next, next Sunday, we're going to have a business meeting at 4 o'clock to vote on that, and we need all voting members of the church to be here. Uh, tonight's your opportunity to kind of see our board's been working hard for many, many months to uh, to navigate through that process and have a presentation, uh, and we'll answer any questions that anybody has, and then next week we'll have an official business meeting to vote on that, because as you know, uh, sometimes things like that require an investment of finances as well, and that is the church's responsibility to, to vote on that. So we want you to be here today at 3, thir- three o'clock, next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Please set a, set a reminder on your calendar, be here Uh, If you're a voting member, we need you to be here uh, to take care of some business in God's house. Have I missed anything, Pastor? All right. Those are all the announcements that we have. Let's welcome Juan up to handle children's lessons this morning. Hasn't Juan and Caitlin been doing a great job? Well, good morning, everyone. And that was pitiful. You can do better than that. I know the kids can. Good morning, everyone. A little bit better. We'll, we'll try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That is a lot better. Well, it's so good to see everybody this morning. I am hope that everyone's having a wonderful morning. Um, I, I'm going to be teaching today instead of Caitlin. Kay, um, her and her family are going through a family loss, so everybody just pray for them um, whenever you get a chance to. So, um, going back to last week, what we talked about. We talked about how this girl named Hannah was just going through a difficult time in her life. She, was, she decided that she couldn't do anything without God. She was like, I'm just going to go ahead and pray. So she, she was like, I'm just going to pray and pray and pray as much as I can. And she, she just wanted God to hear her. She wanted God to hear her so bad. She was like, God, I'll even give you my son's life. Like, I'm just so desperate for you to just, just hear my prayer. Well, then this guy named Eli, he came by, and he was like, girl, what you doing? Like, why why are you praying like that? Did you drink too much chocolate milk? Because I know I get that way when I drink too much chocolate milk. And she was like, no, I am a woman in in a very desperate time right now. And so I I just have to pray my whole entire heart out to God right now. And he was like, oh, okay, well, my bad. He said, well, I hope that you, whatever you need, that God just gives it to you, and that you just go in peace, and that he gives you everything that you need. And this week, we're going to talk about how when we pray to God. So have you ever just, like, started praying, but don't know what to pray about? Because I've done that plenty of times. And never, have you ever just been very nervous about praying? Like, because you don't, you don't know how to pray? Like, there, I've always thought to myself, well, how do, how do I pray? Like, especially when I started, like my, like, my actual relationship with God, I'm just like, well, how do I pray? Do I pray this way or do I pray that way? Especially, especially when I pray in front of people. 
that just gives, I, I'm just always afraid that I'm going to say the wrong thing, or I'm going to pray the wrong prayer, or that it, I'm just going to mess the entire thing up. Well, we're going we're gonna to read from Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. So I'm going to read from the ICB version, the International Children's Bible, because not only can the kids, like, understand it better, I can understand it better, <laughs> because I'm just like, I just can't deal with the fancy words. So we're just going to read from that. Also, while I'm reading, I'm going to, like, do some points. That way um, I can try to break it down. Not dance, but, <laughs> but I can break it down as we go. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners and pray loudly. When they want people to see them pray, I tell you the truth, they already have their full reward. So basically, God is telling us right here to not show off how we pray in front of people. Yes, we can pray together as a church, as a whole, as a family. But when you pray, that is a, that is a connection between you and God. That is a conversation just between you and God. It is not a talent show. It is not to show off how you do it. That is a personal thing between you and him. <clears throat> when you pray, you should go into your room and close the door. Then pray to your father who cannot be seen. Your father can see what is done in secret, and he will reward you. So God really, really loves it when you take your quality time and spend it with him. I know, especially during this quarantine, we have a little bit more time on our hands. And so whenever you're bored and whenever you have absolutely nothing to do, that is the perfect time to just spend your time with God, to pray and to just tell him what all you need. Because he knows, he already knows what you need, but he loves, he absolutely loves to see the effort that you put between uh, your relationship with him. And so that's why it says that. And when you pray, don't be like those people who don't know God. They continue saying things that mean nothing. They think that God will hear them because of the many things they say. Don't be like them. Your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. There again, God already knows what you need. He knows before you can even ask. But all He wants is you during that prayer. He wants your full attention. He just wants, he just wants you in that moment. He doesn't want a prayer that goes like, God, I really pray that I have a wonderful meal at lunch today. Or, God, I really hope that I get to see my favorite TV show. Or, God, I pray that my parents buy my, the video game that I've been wanting for a long time. And no, 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 no. That's not how God works. God is not a genie. He, cannot, he's not a, he, he can't give those type of wishes to you. God gives you what you need. The, the TV shows, that's not a need. That, that is a want, not a need. Those two are two different things. So God gives you what you need. And that's, what, that's, that's what just what he loves. Like the other night, I was in my room, and there was nobody else in there. And I just felt, I just, I just felt like I needed to pray while I had nothing to do. So I prayed and prayed. And really, me and God just had a wonderful fest. I, I was just sobbing and crying, and he was just showing me things, and it was just amazing. And really, those are the wonderful times that you can have with God. So with that being said, everybody just close your eyes, bow your heads, and we'll uh, pray a quick prayer. God, I thank you for everything that you do. I thank you for just letting us be, being able to be here. I know it's difficult times right now, but just the little things we're just thankful for. God, we appreciate the times that we can just be with you, and it's just, I, we just want to love you, and Father, I know that we think in our heads that we have to have that perfect prayer, but you tell us that there is no, that that is actually not a perfect prayer, but there, but the prayer is a connection between you and him, and so that's what, that's why we love you so much, because you, you just love, and you keep loving, it is, it is just so, we just can't ask for anything else. We even, you give us stuff that we don't deserve. And that we can't ask for anything else that's better than that. Thank you, Father, for everything that you do. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, everybody stand up and let's get ready for worship.
y'all give give one a hand going solo this morning thank you Jesus I love uh, I love to watch kids engage and to see them at a very young age begin to recognize the value of worship and uh, it is something that changes the atmosphere changes everything now I want to give a public service announcement um, if you're a faint of heart you may not want to stick around for this message because I'm going to deal with some real stuff some real, real stuff. And uh, I hope and pray there will be a, a challenge and an encouragement to you. I'm going to bear my soul in a couple of areas. Not because of something I dealt with, but because of something God make me, made me feel. And uh, it's, uh, it, it was profound, and I'm still dealing with that. And so, uh, stand with me if you would, please. I know you just got sat down. But now that the, the children's ministry in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, we get a lot of exercise here. Amen. Amen. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. You'll see it on the screen here in a minute. The title of my message today is Not Losing It. This is a critical verse and a critical challenge to you and to me. Let's read it together. Ready? Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that we have instructions and counsel for how to navigate this difficult time that we're in. This isn't the first crisis that the world has endured since you came. But this crisis has affected so many people dramatically. Sometimes it may not have even been physical, but the emotional and the mental aspect. And so, Father, if there was ever a time where we need to gird up the loins of our minds and be ready for action, it's this moment. Holy Spirit, I'm a I don't hold a candle to you in terms of teaching or illumination. I'm asking you today to do something in the heart of every person who hears. Thank you, Father, for the power to share your gospel and your truth. I ask, Lord, that you teach us, give us insight into what we're dealing with right now so that we can apply your word to our situation and see our way forward. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated for a moment. I'm going to jump around a little bit today because there's a lot of things that are, that are going on. And, uh, and, and dealing with this this past week was, uh, to be honest with you, was very difficult. And uh, I was telling Angie for, uh, Thursday, I think it was, about the title. And just recognizing the immense emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual battle that we're dealing with. I think a lot of times that we, uh, we, we're, so, we're so good at being Christians. It's all right if we just, be, we just talk with each other, right? We're so good at being Christians that we, we just play a role. We, sl we, we drive onto a parking lot, and then we play a role in that place and go back to our everyday, ordinary, same old, same old life. And, and it's not there like it is here. But see, the great thing about the kingdom is you can be real. 
Just like what mom was talking about this morning. You can be real. You can be real in prayer. You can be real in life. And so just give me a, about 10 minutes to build something here, put some framework together, and then we're going to go forward. Now, in 1 John chapter 2, we have instructions here that we are very prone to forget. And I want you to understand something. This is in the, in the emphatic in the original Greek. It's not, a, it's not an invitation. Don't love the, No, it's do not love this world. Read it with me, please. Ready? Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And if, if you don't think that this world, that the world, is, is an attraction, and sometimes we think, well, all this just happened in our generation. No, it's always been this. So watch, what, watch what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Here's a ministry associate that God equips, calls, and anoints to be with Paul when he needed him most. And this man, Demas, he's, he's noted in Scripture for one thing, and that's deserting. He deserted the one he was called to serve. He deserted the Lord who called him and equipped him to serve. And he serves as a reminder to you and, and to me today that it is possible to allow the love that we have for this present darkness, because that's what this is. It's possible for us to allow our, our, our fascination and fixation and pursuit of the things we see actually drown out and kill and quench the Holy Spirit in us and cause us to be blinded to the things of the kingdom and to love what is in this temporary world. Can somebody say amen? Now, Jesus says, if you've got your Bible with you, and I pray you do, uh, look over at John chapter 12 with me just for a second. In the verses preceding uh, verse 31, Jesus uh, says, let me just begin, in, it's, it won't be on the screen, but just follow with me in verse 27. Jesus, the words in red, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, somebody say purpose, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Then the, therefore the people who, watch this, the people who stood by, and heard it, said that it had what? Thunders. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me before your sake. Now watch this next verse right there on your screen. Now is the judgment of this world. Did you see that? Now is the judgment of this world. When Jesus made that statement, Jesus was saying, the whole purpose and intention for my appearing here is accomplished. Now is the judgment of this world. The thunder confused some people. That was God's voice saying, that's my son. That's my son. He's on an assignment for me. He's on a mission for me. He's going to accomplish what I sent him to do. That's why Jesus said, shall I pray, Father, deliver me from this hour? No, I, I was born for this hour. You know what? So were you for this hour. I hear people oftentimes talking about how much pressure they feel. And I want you to know something. If you are not feeling pressure, you are weird. Come on. If you're not feeling pressure, then something's not right in your spirit. Because if you're living in this age and generation, this very moment in history, you feel a sense and a dimension of spiritual warfare that you have never sensed before. Can I get a witness someplace in the house? You're seeing things, sensing things, experiencing things, feeling things you've never, never felt before, never gone through before. Why is that? Because we're in the crosshairs of a dramatic kingdom shift. God is doing something in the earth, and when, when parts and pieces are moved in the supernatural realm, you and I feel it physically and emotionally and mentally. Can somebody say amen? That's what Jesus in Luke chapter 10. I love this account when Jesus sends out the 70. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, read, that, read verse 19 with me, ready? Behold, I give you the authority 
to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Stop right there. Okay, let's try that one more time. That second line, ready? Over all. Y'all don't sound very convincing. Let's try that one more time. Over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, if you know who Jesus was speaking to, you recognize that his disciples were there. The only one of his disciples that did not die a martyr's death was John on the Isle of Patmos. He was boiled in oil by Emperor Domitian, one of the cruelest people who ever lived. And yet, though he should have died, God kept him alive as a sign. But the rest of his disciples died at the hands of their enemies. And yet Jesus says, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. How, the, how, how could that possibly be fulfilled if Jesus, if, if his disciples died? See, when you recognize that you and I were born again for another world. See, citizenship in heaven does not start when you get I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. No, 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 that's, that's not when that happens. When at, the moment you, at the moment you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and <sighs> breathes life into you. At that moment, you become a supernatural being. Now, the outer man, this piece, this, this flesh, this body bag, I call it, that you and I carry around with us, it's aging by the second. Come on, say amen, somebody. It's not as strong as you used to be. It's not as pretty as you used to be. Some of y'all don't take that or don't receive that, do you? But, but the reality is that we have already mig migrated from the natural into the spiritual, from the, from the seen to the unseen, from what is, what, what is obvious to what is real. And so I'm saying all this because I want you to understand some things. I want you to understand that what you're experiencing right now is not an accident. I'm going to share with you from Scripture today, from Daniel chapter 7, verse number 25. And we're going to talk about this wearing out. Now, if you read a prophetic scripture, and you should, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you interpret it, you, you'll understand that uh, this, this is a, this is a, a future uh, prophecy. And this is what the Holy Spirit gave Daniel. He shall speak words against the Most High. This is an angel's voice. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out. Somebody say, wear out the saints of the Most High, and plan to change times and law, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and half a time. And there's a lot of things here, and if, if Michael or Brother Dan was here, they would tell you the prophetic implications. But I, I want to I deliver this to you this morning. This is what I want to share with you. This wearing out is happening right now. You and I, we're like a, we're like a block of wood, and that, that sander is working overtime on us. And the problem is when there are some issues and aspects of your nature and mind that are not quite Christ-like yet, hello, somebody, that when that, that, that part of the flesh that you, that you and I sometimes shield and protect, Lord, I got this. My daddy was like that. His daddy was like that. And that's when the Holy Spirit says, come on back here. I got my sander. You fix and take a licking. You know why? Because God is committed to transforming you and me into the image of Jesus. And he's not going to stop. So as long as we're in this body, we're going to be, we're going to be worn out. We, we're going to be afflicted. This, this word, this, this Aramaic word, it's the only time it's used in the, the entire Bible. And, and I, I, this, I love definitions. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, just, I really do. I, just, I get carried away with it sometimes. But I love this. It means to afflict or to harass constantly. Isn't that what you feel? You and I are afflicted and harassed constantly. Every time that you just, you get, you know, you're in a good place and things can be rocking along pretty good, whatever. And what happens? Turmoil. An attack, an assault, a betrayal. Somebody, something, something in your world happens and all of a sudden you're, man, I was just, I was just starting to feel this and here we go again. You know what? God's not obligated to keep you happy. He's going to make you holy. And sometimes that, those two things don't always jive. Now, for the young people here this morning, give me, give me 10 minutes, please. When I was studying this passage in Daniel, who diminished by constant friction, I was aware, I remember something I heard many years ago from a psychiatrist in Texas. He 
practiced at a behavioral health unit at a hospital where I served at. And he would give continuing education classes, and although I was not a psychiatrist or psychologist, I always was fascinated with that, and so I would go to his classes, to his lectures. And he said this. He said, the reason why so many young people are in our facility today, and believe me, there were more young people, I'm talking 30 and under, that were in the behavioral health unit than there were uh, over. And he said, the reason why, he said, he said, they cannot process what they are seeing. They cannot process what they're seeing. And so I, I, need, I need a credible witness, so I'm, I'm calling out Robbie Zacharias, the greatest apologist of our generation. He said, two of the most powerful forces in the world today are music and television. They're powerful and they're good in many ways, but they're also very risky because music and visual has the capacity to bypass reason and go straight for the imagination. When you listen to something by word, this is powerful. This is very powerful. When you listen to something by word, your imagination remains sovereign over it. But when a picture is given to you, that imagination becomes sovereign over you. The, the, the picture, the image becomes sovereign over you. When a picture is given to you, that imagination becomes sovereign over you, and television is now conquering the last bastion. They want our young people not just listening to music anymore. They want to rivet the pictures that are associated with the music upon the imaginations of our young people. It's the last threshold to be crossed. And television is crossing it with devastating consequences as the imagination has been evaded. And by the way, the reason I'm sharing this is because it's not just young people that are moved by the images. We are raising a generation, Robbie said, of young people all over this globe where the imagination no longer, watch this, has the capacity to harness it because the intellect no longer can keep up with the barrage of pictures invading it. We are meant to see through the eye with the conscience. Notice that. We are meant to see through the eye with the conscience. Modern communication is getting us to see with the eye, devoid of the conscience. People can't process it. We see more images in one day than people who had a television in the 1950s saw in a year. We see more images in one day. And all that, all that stuff flashes through our eyes. It's all, that stuff is, is, is uh, downloaded onto our hard drive. And we've got, we've got millions and billions of images that, are, that, are, that we're trying to work, work through. And see, here's the thing. Satan will use those pictures, those images, those impressions to wear you out. He will harass you. He will chase you. William Blake, the great English poet, said this. He said, this life's dim windows of the soul, this right here, distorts the heaven from, from pole to pole and leads you to believe a lie when you see with, not through, the eye. What is that about? See, the natural man, the natural man depends on visual. On this. The spiritual man depends on what is spiritual. I don't see heaven with my naked eye. I see with the eyes of my heart. I don't see the, 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 the things that God has prepared for those who love him, who loves him. I don't see those things with the eyes of my, of, of, of my vision. I see those things with the eyes of my heart. So Satan wants to overload you. Please hear me. Satan wants to overload you by flushing your mind and your imagination with images that you cannot process. And that's the reason why day after day after day, we go to bed, we're, we didn't do a cotton picking thing except turn the channel. Hello, somebody. But in the process, we are worn smooth. See, this, 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 uh, this, uh, uh, line, line, this line of assault is consistent. My granddaughter's on the front row, Sydney. She's five years old. Sydney could do things on an iPad I can't even, when my phone gets messed up, she takes it and fixes it for me. It's awesome. And I see that beautiful little face there, and she, she knows verbiage, she knows terminology, she knows words I, I had, I didn't learn I was in, in my 20s. I'm still not really sure I understand the meaning of them. But at her age, she's already seen and experienced more than most people 100 years ago did in 60 years. So what was that about? I'm so glad you asked. Go ahead, please. Paul says, so that we would not be exploited by the adversary, Satan, for we know his clever schemes. He's got lots of tools in his tool belt. If, if he knows, he knows, he doesn't, he cannot read your thoughts, by the way. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, somebody. But he can watch your actions. And he will use a tool 
that might work on Scott Fowler that would never work on me. Because he watches us. He tracks us. The Bible says he goes about as a roaring, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I don't believe, in my honest opinion, I do not believe that Christians in our generation understand that we do not play games with Satan. We watch things we have no business watching. Go ahead and throw some tomatoes at me if you got them. If you bought them from, from Susan, she may give them back to you. If, if you and I are not diligent in protecting the gate of our mind and protecting the gate of our eyes, we are setting ourselves up to be victims of Satan, not victors over him, but victims of him. We are not supposed to be ignorant of his devices and schemes. But I see in the body of Christ a mass ignorance. We watch movies that our mothers and grandmothers would never have, let it, would let, never have gone to. We think nothing of it. You know, used to, there was, the, the rating system was to, was to protect children. Now they need some ratings to protect adults. Come on, get saved in somebody. We watch things, and, and our, ear, our ears and our eyes are exposed to so much, and what we're doing is we're falling into the trap that he set for us. We don't respect his power. Well, Satan's under my feet. Not if you turn the channel on that, he's not. He's sitting in the chair right beside you saying, that's a good choice, I like that. Devices. Wiles, plans, purposes, designs, conspiracies. That's who we're dealing with. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Listen, we're, we're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. This whole thing is about finishing the race. It's not getting there first. It's finishing it, period. And that's the reason why you and I are dealing with things right now spiritually that we never thought we would have to deal with. Can I get a witness someplace here? My wife and I talk often because it's because she's my soulmate, she's my life mate, she's everything. And I tell her sometimes, honey, I don't get this. I just don't understand. And we, we, we know, we're close to the same age. She's, she's many years younger than me, but we're close to the same age. And we recognize what's going on around us. We're at the end of the age, Brother Ron. We're at the moment in time where instead of, instead of things getting better before, as, as we get closer to glory, they're going to get worse and harder. The challenges are not going to diminish, my friend. They're going to escalate, and you are the target. And if you don't walk circumspectly, wisely in this generation, you're going to be a victim of the adversary because he's always working. He's always working. Just nudge your neighbor and tell them, you need to wake up and pay attention. Speaking of that, Romans chapter 13, read it with me, please. And do this. Come on, ready? Read it. Read it with me. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The word provision is the, the Greek term is pronoia. It means setting aside a deposit for future use. It's saving up so that when the time comes to party hardy, you got some reserves there. I'm scared to death for the body. Can I just, I'm going to be brutally honest today. And if I get fired, I get fired. It's just how it is. I'm petrified when I think about the body of Christ. I see people emboldened doing exactly what this book says not to do. And doing it because, but, well, I, I, want, I phoned a friend. Listen, listen, if you're going to be judged for something, if you and I are supposed to live up to this word, listen, when you, when you transgress, you step outside of the will of God to do your own agenda, what are you doing? You're spitting in the face of God. You're slandering the sacrifice of Christ. And you make yourself a partner with darkness. And I'm watching Christians, little by little by little, they don't, you know why they don't practice the word? Because they don't know the word. Sometimes we spend an hour, nothing, Pastor Kelly, please don't take this personally. I know, I know you won't take this personally. But it's wonderful to sing worship. It's wonderful to sing songs and, and, and to just sense the presence of Jesus. But when you sit down and get a 10-minute cupcake message that's supposed to last you for 168 hours, no wonder we're victims of the enemy. You need the word in you. You need, the word, you need the word every single day of your life. That's why Paul says this. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Your bodies. Say it with me. Your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing. What? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. The renewing of your mind. That, why is the renewed mind necessary? See, the next part, it's, it's a polysyndeton. It's like a, it's a box car. And, and, and the, the one box car ends at, at mind, and the next box car picks up with that. So the polysyndeton connects to, connects to the, the, the box cars. So it's not be transformed by the renewing of your mind end. It's that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the ability to recognize Satan's schemes and to recognize what is good and pleasant and perfect is completely dependent upon a renewed mind. I really, I really have to ask for grace right now. Because I'm going to tell it, I'm going to tell what happened two weeks ago. Two straight Saturdays. As God is my witness, I have felt a lot of things. I'm emotional just like anybody else. I've got emotions. Sometimes they have me, but most of the time I have them. Two Saturdays ago, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was home. It's unusual. I use them up here on Saturdays, but I was, was home. And uh, I walked outside. My son was out there. I walked outside and said something to him. I forget what I was talking to him about. And I came back inside, and Billy, a spirit got on me. And I felt a hopelessness and an agony I have never felt in all of my 63 years of life. And I literally, I went to the bedroom. My wife was in the kitchen doing something. I, went to, I shut the door. She used to me taking naps when I'm, when I'm at home. And I laid on the bed not to take a nap. I was in warfare, spiritual warfare. And Michael, I felt something come over me and grab me around my neck and begin to choke me. And Brother Ron, about the time I was, I was, I was going to rebuke it, I know, I know spiritual authority. I have spiritual authority. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? You need to feel this. And I said, why? He said, what do you think? What are you feeling? What do you, what do you think? What do you see? What do you sense? And I said, I, I just want to end it. He said, exactly. He said, there's a suicide spirit all over this mountain. And you're trying to reach people that you don't understand what they're dealing with. Now you know. Brother Ron, I said, Lord, take it from me, please. I get, I get it. He said, no. No. I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to wrestle with this. I want you to understand what you're dealing with, son. This is not a game. Lives are at stake. And when you ask God to give you souls, they're going to come to the, to the church. They're not going to be like you want them. They're going to be jacked up and messed up. They're going, they're going, to, be, they're going to be one, mo one moment, one, one hour away from the ER. Thankfully, thank you, Jesus. I, I'm grateful that God knows my limits because I sure don't. I was okay. Then the next Saturday, I was off. I was at home. And I got in the car to go someplace. It wasn't going to work. I got in the car to go someplace. I, I turned the ignition. And the moment I did that, same exact spirit came and hit me. And I sat in my car. I pulled in, into the driveway. I didn't pull out on Carlisle. I pulled into the driveway. And I promise you, as Jesus is my witness, I felt like I felt all the breath in my body go out. Choking me. I'm sitting here thinking, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And I tried to breathe. I was short of breath. I, I couldn't do any. I, I couldn't even, I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. And the Lord said, I'm, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. That's all I can do. 
and the, and, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to feel what the people you're trying to reach feel. And I'm going to keep doing this until you get it. And you know what I said? Lord, I got it. I promise. And then he told me to tell you what, what he did. And here's why I'm saying this. This word, see that picture right there you're, you're seeing? Not losing. This, is, this is the people we're trying to reach. They're fighting with everything they can just to make it to another day. They have, they have warfare that you and I do not respect or understand. I understand it now. I know if I told the board that day or Angie on Monday, I'd, get, I'd probably, somebody would have brought some, a, straight, a, a straight jacket and hauled me off to some place or whatever. I'm not crazy. My wife is here. You, well, no, don't talk to her. Talk to Chase. No, Diane knows. Diane knows better than anybody on the planet. Chase, you know. I, I was in that warfare. And I said, God, why are you doing this? And he said this, he said, they're close to you. They're close to you. Pastor Andy, I began seeing faces, the children that we minister to every week. I began seeing faces. I began calling out names. I began pleading the blood of Jesus over these babies. I don't know what they deal with. Some of, some of them I, I know by face, but not by name. And I just began to intercede and plead the blood of Jesus over these children. And yet God said, every day, every day, every day, every day. He said, when, when the ministry teams go out on, on Wednesday night, they're walking into Hell's Kitchen. They're walking into, into complete and total darkness. And they're feeding the souls, not just the bodies, they're feeding the souls of those who are literally in the crosshairs of the adversary. And you are called to stand in the gap. Pastor Andy, Angie, I need you. Scott and Julie, Daniel, please. Kelly, Dixie. Larry, who am I missing? Do you know what a church does? Do you know what a church does, really? Does a church just schedule nice services and we're trying to craft the presentation that the outsiders who would never darken the doors of a church, you know, they, well, I, I heard about your music program. Heard you have a great kids ministry or a great youth ministry. That's not what's going on here. What you're looking at, this, this is what's standing in the firing line every single day. And the warfare is intense and violent. And I want to tell you something. That right there, that's not just a young man with glasses. That's everybody we meet today. They're fighting with everything they have just to hold on. You know, you know our ministry is so hard? It's so hard because if you want to pay the price, be prepared. See, the biggest problem we have in ministry is not that there's not somebody, some extra folks to help cook and, and, and drive. That's not, what we, that's, not, that's not the problem. The problem in ministry is these people have lives and careers. And they have to have a prayer life that is second to none. Because they're called to warfare every single day. And you and I, we're the ones standing between the living and the dead. I'm asking this congregation this morning, stand with me please. I hate, if I made you uncomfortable, I apologize. I didn't want to do that, but I have to be, I have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand what we're dealing with here. We are in a warfare, the likes of which you and I have never, ever seen. When I was a baby Christian, Pastor Andy, open that for me if you would, please. When I was a baby Christian, back in the, uh, the mid-80s, thank you, sir. A lady named Pat Fadley walked up to me one Sunday morning when we were part of the prayer team there. And she stuck a book in my face and said, read this. I said, what is it? I mean, I didn't, I didn't even know sound doctrine. I just knew Jesus. And the name of the book, was, it, was a, it was a novel by a man named Frank Peretti called This Present Darkness. Anybody ever heard of that book? Don't read it. <laughs> and so 
She said, I'm going to give you, I want a book report next Sunday. So you gave me seven, I, I was a prolific reader at that point. And uh, she said, I want a book report in seven days. So the next Sunday, Pat's there waiting for me. She always got there at 6. I got there at 6.30, Sunday mornings. She said, well, what'd you write? And I said, Pat, Miss Pat, I don't, I don't think I'm going gonna, I'm, I gonna to be any good in this. I have no idea that there's that many skirmishes and battles and warfare going up over, over my head. I don't know if I'd be any good at this. Terry, she said, my son, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. She said, she said, Glenn, it's not your strength, it's his. She said, when you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, she said, you're not do that on Sunday. You do every day. Before you leave the house, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you're not allow your mind to take you places you should never go. And for 35 and a half years, come here, honey. For 35 and a half years, we've been fighting, Brother Ron, every single day. And you know what I came to say today? If you want a fun church, a happy church, a church where everybody drinks coffee and wears designer shirts, go for it. That's not this church. We're called to stand between the living and the dead. We're called to draw a line and say, no, Satan, you're not coming past this. You're not coming across this line. This is my territory. Back up. See, the Bible doesn't tell, us, tell me that he's taking my territory. It tells me I'm supposed to take his. No one's in from Pastor Andy and the other uh, Scott and the other team members go out. You know what they're doing? They're taking territory from the adversary. And Satan hates their guts for it. And they get attacked for it. They get, their health gets attacked. Their minds get attacked. Their families get attacked. Their finances get attacked. But you know what? I know these people. You know what they say? If that's all you got, I'm going back next week. And the next week they get punched in the teeth and knocked down and challenged. And they limp home and put some Band-Aids and some, uh, some Mercure Chrome whatever that stuff is, you know, that turns your orange and, and they, they bind up their wounds and they pray in the Holy Ghost and come next, next Wednesday, they go right back out into it. It's a constant assault. And Crossroads does not exist to make everybody happy. Crossroads is here because there's a, there are communities here that nobody else will go into. And those kids need a church that loves them enough to have ministers like you're seeing right here that say no. No, 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 Satan, you, you, you can mark them for destruction all you want to, but they're mine in Jesus' name. That community belongs to the kingdom of God, not to you. Back away. People who stand their ground and say, no, you're not taking another square inch. You're not taking another lot. Last year, last year, two times when I went into driving into a particular parking lot to pick up kids, there were cops everywhere. The children got on the, on the van that night. One of them said, so-and-so and so-and-so attempted suicide for the second time. What? We're driving around, and there's cops everywhere, and these, these kids are telling me that's this and that and the other one. And one of those little girls, she's 14, actually. She's probably 15 now. She came up between the seats and she said, you must not know our neighborhood. She said, this goes on all the time. I'm driving one hand, crying, snotting, trying to see the road. Reach over and I got that little girl's hand. I said, Jesus, I began to pray in the Holy Ghost to that little baby because she lives in hell. That's what we're dealing with. I know we're not supposed to touch hands and hold hands and all that kind of stuff, but you know what? If you can, uh, can I get the top side to come down here for just a minute? Thank you, Jesus. 
Jesus. I'm so glad to see you, Eric. Talent. You connected? Father, this battle is fierce. Sometimes we are so wounded. It takes all the energy we can muster to get out of bed in the mornings because the warfare never stops. We're battling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. But you've called us to this warfare, you assigned us to this community. We didn't pick our territory. You picked it for us and said, serve there and die there if you need to, but don't abandon your post. Stand in the gap for those who cannot stand for themselves. Jesus, today, God, let us see our mission field like you see our mission field. Help us understand the awful torment mentally and physically and spiritually that many around us are suffering. And God, you put, you allowed us to, to sense a little bit of that today. But God, we, we declare this morning in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we have no strength but yours. We have no strategy but what you give us from heaven. And God, we may make a lot of mistakes, but we're teachable. And God, more than anything else, we're faithful. Others may abandon their post, but Lord, I'm standing right here. I'm standing in my community. I'm standing with those children who don't know where their next meal is coming from, who feel exposed, who live in some, in some cases a life none of us could possibly imagine. God, today we lift up this community to you in the name of Jesus. Marshall County, Alabama, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy on this county. Jesus, the families that are fighting and struggling and hurting. Jesus. Jesus. God, I pray in the name of we pray in the name of Jesus that the churches that just want to have pretty church come in for an hour and go and eat a buffet. Lord, wake up some saints. There's more to spiritual life than singing and sitting and soaking and eating. There's more to that. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, work in our community. God, we lift up those babies to you this morning in the name of Jesus, the ones we go visit every week. We lift them up to you in the name of Jesus. You know where they are. You know where they're suffering, what they're suffering. You know how they're hurting. We pray in the name of Jesus to their little minds. We pray for their imaginations that have been hijacked by images they can't even process. Their youth is being stolen. Their childhood has been ripped from their hands. Their minds are a battleground, even at young ages. Jesus, Jesus, have mercy. Father, I ask you for the members of this congregation. I ask you, God, to sustain them as they serve you. God, these are not rebels or renegades. They're not refugees. They're not looking to relocate to some greener pasture. God, you assigned them here. And come heaven, hell, or high water, they're going to be in the fight. They're going to be faithful to you. Jesus, today, I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would comfort those children that we see in our mind's eye right now. God, those that want to end it all, those who have had ideas and and even plans in some measure to end their life. 
Holy Spirit, wrap your arm around your arms around them right now and let them know they're loved and cherished. And the warfare they're feeling, though fierce, is not stronger than you. Thank you, Jesus. God, comfort the distressed. Give assurance and comfort to those who are hurting so desperately. God, be in our families, those in our families who do not, do not know you, who are far from you. Jesus, have mercy on them. Draw them to your heart, Lord. God, that they would not live another day in their life outside the kingdom of God. That they would treasure and cherish the old rugged cross, the Savior who bled and died for them and rose again for them and ascended to heaven for them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, today we go in the strong name of Jesus. We're not asking for a break. We're asking for help from you. Touch us, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost if you know how. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God that's in us and on us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Let us sense and feel what others that we serve are feeling. Thank you, Jesus, for this body of saints. Thank you, Lord. God, this week we depend on you. We need you. We know, Lord, that you are for us, not against us. And God, we ask you in the name of Jesus, renew our minds by the Holy Ghost. Let us rest in him. Let us find our hiding place in the sweet Holy Spirit. He comforts us. He encourages us. He challenges us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, we go today in obedience to your great command and commission. We'll be faithful until you call us home. Lord Jesus, so help us, God. Everybody say amen, amen. Come on, give Jesus. Ovation of praise. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray for you every single day, I promise you. And if there's anything we can do to help you and your family, your situation, let us know. We love you. We'll see.